This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay. Um, uh, je suis désolé que je vais parler en anglais, mais uh, et donc je veux m'excuser. Uh, mais au moins, il, il, uh, vous ne devez pas uh, écouter mon accent afro. Uh, mais s'il y a des mots uh, que vous ne comprenez pas, uh, m'indiquez uh, et je, veux, uh, je vais le traduire ou essayer de le traduire. Aussi, si je, je parle trop vite, m'indiquez aussi. aussi. D'accord, en anglais. <laughs> In 1793, Gilbert Innes, a Scottish merchant living in London, wrote home. He described how life in the capital had made him softer in manners and gentler in his feelings. To illustrate this, he recounted what had happened when a friend came to breakfast. After eating, they were assailed by a terrible stink. Innes opened the window. It came in worse than before. Shutting it hastily, in hopes the door would answer better, he reported, I was almost suffocated with the most damnable of all stinks. I instantly parted with breakfast on the stairs, he reported, but had the consolation to see my worthy friend still more oppressed in getting his breakfast off his stomach. Indeed, the whole people in the house suffered the difficulty of disgorging the supper of the preceding evening. <laughs> uh, this, and this is, this is a letter to his wife and children. <laughs> the, nightman, <who's coughs> the nightman, he explained, whose business of, is to clean out repositories of filth and who is employed in his dirtiest of all works when people are asleep, had not finished on time. Under the onslaught of excremental stench released by this nocturnal labourer, affable sociability disintegrated and bodily control disappeared. Now this episode provides an arrestingly cloacal counterpoint to influential strands in the historiography of early modern England. In recent years, we've heard much about the progress of politeness and the impact of improvement on urban life. Increased affluence and the consumer culture of <laughs> cottons and China, it's argued, fostered comfort and cleanliness, delicacy and decorum. Amanda Vickery, for instance, has vividly documented the central role which neatness came to play in the conceptual and physical organisation of middling and upper sort households. A range of medical, urban and cultural historians ranging from Alain Corbin to Emily Kakane, from Lawrence Stone to Lisa Sarenson, have all written of a growing distance from and growing intolerance of dirt over the long 18th century. Even though, when you read them more carefully, you find that these narratives are mutually contradictory in their chronology and methodology, not to mention their explanatory and epistemological frameworks. Innes's experience, by contrast, reveals how excrement and nastiness continued periodically and indeed necessarily to erupt upon and impact uh, with, so and interact with the neat, the nice, and the polite. The Italian physician Bernardino Ramazzini enjoined the readers of his book on the diseases of workers in 1700 that it should, it should not, quote, be beneath the dignity of the philosopher to descend now and then from his contemplation of the sublime and to survey grosser things. Indeed, he explained, the inspiration for his study had been a discussion with a man employed cleaning out privies. It was time, Ramazzini argued, for doctors to leave the cinnamon-scented apothecary shop and, quote, take a view of houses of office. And for the next 41 minutes, this paper will follow his advice. For until the mid-Victorian construction of interconnecting sewers, the dirtiest of all works, emptying cesspits, was crucial if metropolitan living space was not to be swamped 
When Gustave Flaubert heard of a planned strike by Parisian Vidangeur in 1865, he sketched a scatological opera featuring a chorus of cesspool workers and, quote, an eruption of Vesuvius, tableau of Paris, buried beneath a layer of turds like Herculaneum beneath lava. Two centuries earlier, a London civil servant was more prosaic. In October 1660, Samuel Pepys went down into his cellar and put my foot in a great heap of turds, by which I find that Mr. Turner's house of office is, over, is full and comes into my cellar. Um, uh, Mr. Turner was his neighbour. Pepys who was, of course, fond of, no, fond of nothing more than preening himself within a newly cleaned study, uh, noted in his diary that this doth trouble me. And he resolved, I will have it helped. Five days later, and at a cost of 31 shillings and sevenpence, Nightman emptied the vault and removed the nuisance. Pepys was managing the socio-technical vagaries of London sanitation. By 1600, most of its houses had access to some kind of privy. Chamber pots and slot buckets were, in theory, to be emptied down it rather than thrown into the street or drains. Some houses of office discharged into the Thames and other watercourses, even though this was contrary to law. Many more drained into brick or stone-lined cesspits of varying dimensions, generally located either in domestic backspace, i.e. in a garden, in a yard, or in a corner of a row of tenements, or beneath the basement of the property. Water closets, quote, as one, quoting to quote one ad early advertisement, preventing the rise of all offensive effluvia and preserving the air of the place therein, began to be advertised in the 1770s, but their spread was only gradual. Up to the 1810s, moreover, more often than not, they discharged into a cesspool and were thus emptied again by a nightman rather than into a sewer. Throughout the long 18th century, therefore, Londoners relied largely on privies and cesspools to manage the pound and a half of faecal matter which they each evacuated each day. Such pits, however, were only holding operations. They had periodically, every three to five years seems to have been normal, to be emptied. Now, in the country, as Carolyn Steedman's recently noted, digging out privies was a standard part of servants' general duties. In the metropolis, by contrast, it was, a, <coughs> it was an ancient and specialised trade. This work was undertaken by nightmen, also known as Pullman, gold, find, gold Finders, or Tom Turdman. I'm going to continue using the male form of this, night men, because although women, as we'll see, were able to maintain businesses as contractors of nightmen, it, this is actually a very, very strongly gendered trade. The labour in the cesspits seems to have been overwhelmingly, uh, exclusively male, and indeed the contemporaries only used this male terminology. I'm very happy to talk further about the gendering of this in discussion afterwards. But once one considers Nightman's work, one can't help noticing how exhausting, dangerous, abject labour was key to the sustenance of polite lifestyles and styles of sociability. This point's all too often obscured in a historiography dazzled or is that bedazzled by the sheen of new consumer goods? Secondly, I want to stress that Nightmen were a revealingly contradictory to human technology. Their trade was incontrovertibly a necessity for decent and healthy living, but in removing the accumulated contents of a metropolitan privy stirred up a tsunami of stench which engulfed and nauseated the residents who'd filled it. <coughs> Nightman therefore simultaneously preserved and disrupted standards of decency and salubrity. Studying their work offers an opportunity to explore the cultural resonance of a dirty trade. You know, the French phrase metier ville is quite a good um, 
translation of that, and to see how its position and reputation compared with other dishonourable trades analysed in Central Europe by Anton Bloch and Cathy Stewart, and also to compare them with the often stigmatised plague workers such as the Pisigamorti of Venice or the house cleaners described in Florence and Geneva by Julia Calvi and Bill Nafee. What I'm going to do in the remainder of this talk is first rapidly sketch the practice, organisation and associations of the trade. Then I'm going to look at Nightman's use of print, highlighting their self -present, or the self-presentation of some of those who made a living from the removal of other Londoners' wastes. Now, in the metropolis, gung firmers, privy emptiers, were a recognised occupational group by the mid-15th century. In 1466, the aptly named John Lovegold petitioned the city for a monopoly of privy emptying. In 1615, the Lord Mayor and Alderman introduced a licensing system restricting the emptying of privies in the city to a dozen specified nightmen and four carters. All of these had to give a bond of £10, a not inconsiderable sum of money, to observe rules about their behaviour, equipment and prices. And this, op this system was still in operation um, in the later 18th century. Now, in, the 16, in 1655, the Cries of London contained an image of a city nightsman alongside that other nocturnal officer, the bellman. And this Cromwellian figure would have recognised the working practices used two centuries later. For Henry Mayhew, in his uh, London Life and London Poor, described how the men worked in gangs, a holman who went down and shoveled the orgia into a tub when it was no longer possible just to dip and fill it. The ropeman who hauled up this tub. And, <clears throat> and the tubman who carried the full container out into the street, climbed up ladders and poured it into a night cart. Such night workers had real skills. Bodily work practices highlighted by recent anthropological work, such as by Agnes Jean-Jean and Robin Nagel. But these are precisely the kinds of work which is often, and skills which are often obscured by historians writing dismissively of manual labour as undifferentiated, or who think of dirty trades as needing no more than a strong stomach. That tub, once full, weighed eight stone, that's uh, 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 100 kilograms, um, requiring adroit handling. Tubman needed to coordinate and choreograph their movements as they carried and tipped the load. Horses, standing still the night through, require, needed to be really well trained. And occasionally one glimpses a work culture which is truly submerged from history. The Nightman's Pole, which sometimes featured as their shop sign, probed the pit's dimensions and consistency in order to estimate the time it would take to empty that space. In the fateful night of, ex evacu of excavation, which might last two or even three nights, one old baby case, for instance, talks of recovering a pump from under eight and a half feet of human ordure, was apparently known as a wedding, a consummation devoutly to be sniffed. The night cart, which you can see there, was apparently also known as a bride. In, 1780, in a 1781 infanticide case, a constable testified that the child who'd been found dead lay under what they, i.e. the nightmen, call the crust, suggesting that they had their own vocabulary for the excremental spaces in which they worked. Now, these spaces were dangerous. Mutuality and speed were crucial for the successful accompaniment of the work. When asked by Bernardino Ramazzini why he worked with a great deal of anxiety and eagerness, a nightman lifted up his eyes from the dismal vault and replied that none but those who have tried it could imagine the trouble of staying above four hours in that place. Furthermore, the nightman explained, the fumes made you blind. 
Nightman also risked being overcome by the, quote, severity of the stench, which both medical and lay witnesses at coroner's inquests testified could fatally suffocate the workers. They also risked collapsing from cold. cold. Knight Holman worked half naked in unheated houses of office. In 1769, for instance, James Buckley, a labourer in Westminster, described how he, Charles Sheldon and Joseph Woodward, had been employed emptying a privy in Haymarket. Eventually, they'd had to go down and start filling the bucket with a shovel. Sheldon came up, quote, his eyesight failing. Buckley and Woodward then alternated in five-minute stints until the former heard Woodward cough and draw his breath very short. He recalled that Woodward looked up and came up halfway, but then fell back. Buckley, in his testimony, describes descending to tie a rope round him, how the rope broke, how he finally pulled Woodward out, and how Woodward died two hours later. Working... <coughs> The interdependence of men like Woodward, Sheldon and Buckley, who were well aware of the dangers that they faced, probably fostered a solidarity which was only intensified by the way in which householders shunned them and paid their servants to keep a very close and suspicious eye upon them. In the early 18th century, the Quaker merchant Peter Briggins, for instance, paid one of his servants 30 pence because he was up all night with the nightman. Such sleep-deprived servants were likely to be resentful and perhaps actively hostile. They, after all, had to stay and clean up afterwards. Thomas Mumford, a servant left to supervise the men who'd come to empty the privy of his master's Spitalfields house in the 1750s, admitted in the Old Bailey that he did not want to tell the nightman who'd collapsed with cold that there was a fire in the kitchen. In other words, nightmen arrived to do a dangerous, difficult and necessary job and were then viewed as malodorous intruders and potential thieves. When not sufficiently supplied, gangs would apparently club together to buy gin, which seems to become an expected perk, to sustain them through the cold of the night and the intensity of the smell. Their consciousness of being wor workers apart may well have fostered, fostered a macho bravado with an aggressive edge towards outsiders. When Mayhew accompanied a team at work one night, one of them declared that the odour was refreshing. When in, 17, in 1847, Dr Lyon Playfair witnessed the emptying of a cesspool after five years' use, he, quote, saw one of the nightmen take up a quantity of the night soil and swallow it to see how it tastes while another rubbed some into his eyes to see if it acted in the same way on the eyes as common night soil. Now, the work, I think, of the sociologist Everett Hughes helps interpret, interpret such apparently self-destructive behaviour. What Hughes did was to compare the work of doctors, hospital orderlies and janitors Three groups of workers who all come into close contact with various kinds of human waste. And he looked at how they were affected by the potential stigma of such distasteful work. Doctors' therapeutic successes, he observed, often absolved them from, quote, the potential uncleanness of their tasks. The janitor, by contrast, quote, does not integrate his dirty work into any deeply satisfying definition of his role that might liquidate his antagonism to the people whose dirt he handles. This, Hughes continued, can become an ego wound, leading the janitor to resent and even to want to get back at his employers. Viewed from this perspective, it's perhaps not surprising if Nightman had sometimes taken surreptitious pleasure in affronting the sensibilities of their employers. Accompanying a gang of Nightmen at work, Mayhew noted how they laughed when a neighbour of a neighbouring house was thrown up, a nightcapped head pot protruded, and then Danon banged the sash with a curse. Spillages of faecal matter, 
and incidents when ordure was poured down the gutter could well have expressed this kind of latent hostility. Now, one didn't set up as a Nightman contractor lightly. The kinds of, sorry, the, uh, um, here I'm talking about the people who entered into bonds of, with the city from 1615 onwards. To become a Nightman, needed thinking, you needed to think about major investment as well as what the neighbours would say. The trade needed you to have horses. It needed you to have specialised carts. You also had to have stabling or some kind of yard or property on which to lay or dump the ordure. And with this investment in plant and horse flesh, it's not surprising that in the 18th and early 19th centuries, businesses were passed on through generations or taken over as going concerns. Furthermore, these businesses often remained based in the same streets and districts for centuries. Nightmen, for instance, were working out of White Cross Street, Old Street, Goswell Street, three streets right on the edge of the city, so if you know London, just north of the Barbican Centre, so just outside the city walls in the 16th century. Because it was much easier to take over an existing night yard um, rather than to open a new one. After all, you're not going to be laying, lowering your neighbours' va property values by maintaining an existing site for the disposal, disposal of night soil. Furthermore, your neighbours, if you're a nightman, were disproportionately likely to be other noxious enterprises such as tanners and, um, and um, uh, slaughterhouses. Now, Anton Bloch and Cathy Stewart, looking at Central European cities, have found that there, between the 16th and 18th centuries, nightmen were part of a caste-like group of dishonourable workers. These workers also worked as civic knackers, i.e. Like killing animals, and municipal executioners. They were deemed infamous. They were shunned by their fellow citizens. And they had to follow this restricted range of employment and were obliged to live outside the city. And in an extended theoretical interpretation, blockers argued that their liminality was rooted in the nature of their trades, mediating nature and culture, intimately connected with wastes and death. And it's tempting to develop this kind of reading for London, highlighting how in the 16th century the peripheral nature of Nightman's yards sustained a symbolic geography of cleansing through expulsion, a geography which was further re-encoded in ritual punishments, such as the occasion in 1535 when Thomas White, a Nightman, was convicted of throwing three tons of ordure into the kennels, i.e. the gutters, running down into the Thames. He was placed in one of his own pipes and made to stand in filth with a paper on his head reading for casting of ordure in the open streets. He was then carried, partially immersed in human excrement, through the city and north to Golding Lane, i.e. on the edge of town, where he was dumped. It would also be possible to develop this kind of analysis and fit Nightman into a system of binary polarities, light and dark, legitimate and illegitimate, above ground and below ground, order and disorder. For on occasions, Nightman did indeed feature in the catalogues of abject trades favoured by denigratory political rhetoric. Theirs were indeed deeds of darkness, done in the hours after shops and alehouses were supposed to have shut, and during which the, the watch was supposed to arrest night walkers. It made sense for William Hogarth to include a nightman in that compendium of scatology and disorder, night. This figure, this figure, um, if you read the commentary about Hogarth, every commentator in the 18th century says, this is a nightman emptying waste into a barrel. Every 20th century commentator, Ronald Paulson onwards, produces fantastically sophisticated explanations and symbolic readings to show that it's anything other than a nightman 
If you actually, no one has done this today, if you actually look at the shape of the barrel and compare it with the representation of barrels in some 18th century publicity material for Knightman, this is a night cart barrel. But such a binary polarity, you, you could continue, certainly also underlies the description of Knightman as gold finders. This may have originated from initial employment, retrieving valuable objects dropped down privies. The 17th century poet Samuel Butler wrote of the gold finder that rakes for spoons and bodkins in a jakes. That's a privy. However, it derived much of its piquancy from the ancient link between excrement and gold, between the worthless and the valued a contrast which runs back to classical times and which is most fully developed in alchemical symbolism. Yet dreams of finding money in muck were long-lasting. These fantasies might be literal, as in 1779, when newspapers reported that Knightman and their wives had found 25 guineas and a diamond ring in soil in Primrose Hill, or they might be industrial, as with schemes to turn night soil into saltpetre used to make gunpowder, which were floated during the war years of the 1690s and during the South Sea bubbles, schemes which always produced more stench than profit. But this kind of neatly structuralist reading would be misleading. Although their status was indeed low, Metropolitan nightmen were not affected by the taboo-like notions of disorder that you find around their work in German cities. They were not, in London, specialists in all dirty trades. When John Taylor, the early 17th century water poet, was, went to Germany, he was astounded to find that in Hamburg, the public hangman was multitasking with hangings, headings, breakings of criminals on the wheel, killing dogs, flaying beasts, and emptying vaults, i.e. emptying privies. In the 16th and 17th centuries, nightmen did not double up as rakers, i.e. the people who cleaned the streets of the capital. None of the inventories and wills of the restoration rakers mention night carts, for instance. Until well after the fire, nightmen do not seem also to have swept chimneys. Whereas in Central Europe, the caste-like marginality of nightmen increasingly broke down in the late 18th century, in mid and late 18th century London, night work contractors increasingly became associated with other griming, grimy and carting occupations. But this was in a process of business integration and greater capitalization. By the 17th 40s, uh, some contractors like John Cole were also carting rubbish and, which is building rubble, um, sand and gravel, as well as emptying privies. Some from, from the 1760s, trade cards often describe people as chimney sweeper and nightman, um, but importantly, none of the surviving trade cards from before the 1750s do so. Um, give you Another example. By the late 18th century, some figures were combining night work with street cleaning contracts, and in the case of someone like Henry Hastings, were actually publicising the fact with vignettes of day and night work. And by this era, some figures, like William Woodward, were combining night saw, were, were combining all three trades. As you can see, he's a nightman, he's a carman, i.e. he's doing general rubbish carry and other heavy carrying, and he's a chimney sweep. Such figures were also, by around 1800, integrating night soil with suburban farming, building work, and, rather alarmingly, cow keeping. On this larger scale, such waste work could be enormously lucrative, particularly with the development of the transatlantic trade around 1800 in the dried cakes of manure called poudrette. This involved turning night soil into dry manure and shipping them off to be used as fertilizer in the West Indies on sugar plantations. Nightman's wills confirmed that there could be brass in this particular brand of muck. <laughs> 
In his will of the 1750s, Richard Mokes, a Shoreditch nightman, was worried about the disposal of £200 worth of South Sea stock. In 1823, the possessions of John Gore, chimney sweeper, nightman and dealer in hay and manure, were insured for £2,350. Now, historians generally approach dirty trades, either through the prism of structural functionalist anthropology, itemising the symbolic meanings which coalesce around such figures, the kind of approach you find inspired by Anton Bloch, but also influentially by the British anthropologist Mary Douglas. Or they adopt the spirit of the political scientist James C. Scott, and they look for the hidden transcripts of resistance in the behaviour of such workers. Both these approaches tend to lead to what leave to one side how such potentially stigmatised groups present and presented themselves. And this kind of neglect of self-presentation makes no sense if you're thinking about that section of the nightman's trade which was competing for custom, running businesses, selling and marketing their services. And in this final section of the paper, I'm going to analyse their publicity and in particular, their trade cards, which often actually take the form not of cards, but of uh, flyers or leaflets. This publicity reveals something of the face which Nightman offered to the world between the 1730s and the early 19th century. They also, I'd say, offer a very different perspective on 18th century publicity, consumption, and the world of goods. Because when you look at it, most of the literature on the world of goods in the long 18th century equates consumption with acquiring stuff. Now, hiring a nightman is an act of consumption. It's expensive. It often costs over £10. But what you're doing is you're paying someone quite a lot of money to take stuff away and get rid of it. It's playing some very interesting games with ideas of value. Secondly, recent studies of trade cards and trade publicity by the people like Maxine Berg and John Stobart uh, have really done you know, phenomenal work, but they've emphasised how trade cards added graphic allure and ensured that the potential buyer was attracted by the object, allowing one imaginatively, for instance, in the words of Troy Bickham, to taste the empire. This line of argument leaves very unexplored connections between marketing and the purchase of services. Furthermore, anyone wanting to incorporate the Nightman's commodity into polite representation and graphic allure had certain difficulties. And this produced, I'd argue, some surprising but revealing results. Now first, Nightman's publicity, which interestingly <coughs> never claimed to compete on cost, bills and account books suggest that the price per tonne was pretty well standard regardless of what contractor you had unsurprisingly emphasised the decency and carefulness of their services. John Cole's publicity reassured people that he decently performs all that he undertakes. The same phrase appeared on, um, pub on trade cards 30 years later. John, in the 1750s, John Gibson stressed the orderliness of his operations by offering watchmen who caught other nightmen shooting their soil along the King's Road a ten-shilling reward for every successful conviction. On occasions, nightmen guaranteed the personal touch. Um, in the 1780s, Martha Harrison, based off Oxford Road, trumpeted how she kept night carts for emptying bog houses, which her men perform with utmost expedition and care. Her son always takes particular care to attend in person all who employ her. They also, nightmen also presented themselves as convenient. Edward Edwards, like a number of his competitors, 
noted how he was ready to empty <coughs> privies at the shortest notice, suggesting that nightmen, like modern plumbers, were often called out at import unpleasant moments of crisis. Indeed, these kinds of papers weren't just used as receipts, and most of the work on trade cards has emphasised how they're about receipts, um, but were handed out to householders so that they knew who to call if a watch, a cat, or a child fell down the privy. Technology, too, was vaunted in um, some of this... Um, um, uh, some of these ads, as in so much 18th century trade publicity. Some of the um, mid 18th century, but sorry, in the 1780s, some of the, um, some of the, some of the, in the 1780s, some of the capital's nightmen advertised their use of new invented machine carts for the quick dispatch of business. Yes, this is where we got. Uh, others emphasise their solid roots in the trade through apprenticeship, such as Edward Edwards, kin or marital ties, such as um, um, you have a son-in-law to, to Samuel Colden, or Mary Burnett, who's the daughter of Robert Stone, who's taking on the business, or Elizabeth Norse, who's the widow, or they emphasise their previous experience through having been a foreman to another contractor. Now, Nightman sometimes also claimed association with major institutions and to crown an aristocracy, bolstering their respectability to wealthier households and behaving in the same way as quacks and other tradespeople. Nightman's trade cards seem, incidentally, to have been almost exclusively issued by people working in the West End and in the City of London. So, whereas in the early 18th century, William Reed, tailor-turned-oculist on the left, announced himself His Majesty's oculist-in-chief, and whereas a century and a half later, on the right, Jack Black promoted himself with handbills um, entitled VR, Victoria Regina, Rat and Mole Catcher to Her Majesty, um, and uh, he also went around, you can see VR on his belt, um, which was apparently made of rat skin. Um, <laughs> in this spirit, therefore, Mokes described himself as original knightman to most of the nobility. Landman, Langley, we've already seen, um, was knightman to the excise. Watson and Son were chimney sweepers and knightmen to the Duke of Northumberland. In the later 18th century, this imagery also represented Nightman as in some ways representative of London as a whole. Some cards, like that of Joseph Lawrence or John Brewer, um, uh, sorry, Joseph Lawrence and Samuel Collins, have vignettes of, vi of night carts in a spacious street with a church symbolically in the background. Others, like Samuel Folgers and John Brewers, put St. Paul's in the background. Um, chimney sweeps ads, if one looks at them, frequently show a chimney on fire. Chimney on fire on the right-hand side. Um, Nightman, because one of the things they're doing there is they're actually showing that chimney sweeps are doing some kind of public service by avoiding the danger of fire. Um, Nightman's publicity could never thus could never claim to be uh, preventing immediate danger. Again, you see the chimney on fire. But these kinds of scenes, without claiming the avoidance of public danger, depict, depict night work as a quasi-public service taking place in front space. They also provide an ide they also provide an idealized image of work with laborers subordinated to and, and incorporated within the urban landscape. Like trade cards of coal merchants, another trade which connected street and domestic space, but with the commodity going in the opposite direction. Nightman's trade cards emphasised the division and supervision of work. In the woodcuts publicising William Lingley, I beg your pardon, 
Thomas Crosby, Henry Voyer, John Stevenson, William Woodward, horses graze peacefully in the street. Dutiful Tubman carry out the orgia under the watchful gaze of the nightman holding his pole as a staff of authority. In these depictions of disciplined, orderly industry, a tableau which is even incised on Nightman's brass badges, the disorder of dirt is displaced, and both the inconvenience to the household and the suffering of the workers are erased. Now, whereas many trade cards drew the viewer into the interior of the shop, privy emptying is depicted with reference to the street. Occasionally, as in uh, Robert Stone's um, um, one missing, okay. Uh, just occasionally you see figures in the doorway, but in only one image, that used by Robert Stone and his successors from the 1740s right through to the 1760s, of one is one able to see inside the house. And through, whoop, Okay, that's the one person. That's the one card with um, a figure in the doorway. Um, so. Right through into the house and through into what seems to be the garden where the house of office is located. What's more, Night Soil's ultimate destination, whether shot on Tom Turd's fields near Islington or Whitechapel, or used as fertilizer, is absent from this publicity material. Only in the mid-19th century, amid growing enthusiasm for the use of waste as fertiliser, um, um, did publicity material combine urban soot and soil with pastoral images of productivity. In, as Benoni Hurd's card from the 1740s says, "'Tis soot and soil assist the agricultural toil." But before this, such kinds of sort of snake swallowing its tail, images of fertilisation and productivity are entirely absent. Now, as may already have become apparent as from the previous images, some investment, some, some nightmen invested in their self-presentation. Cards were done by engravers of skill who aestheticised the trade, true cultural transmutation if there ever was one. Lawrence Merchant's trade card was signed by Jean Fougeron, who worked in London producing topographical scenes, historical portraits, and street cries um, in the 1750s. It's an image which was reused by Gibson. The billhead of Thomas, of, sorry, of Thomas Clark, based near Piccadilly in the 1780s and 90s, was done by Edward Malpas, who engraved book illustrations. Pu the publicity for Henry Hastings was done by John Keyes Sherwin, who also exhibited at the Royal Academy. Thomas Morgan not only announced himself nightman and chimney sweeper to the Royal Academy, but used Somerset House as his publicity on his flyers. Moreover, like many other trades, mid-18th century nightman's publicity was framed in elaborate Rococo decoration, like that which Benjamin Cole did for Thomas Woodward, sometimes even with grotesque heads, as in Fougeron's design for Merchant and Gibson. You can see the heads there. Now, how do we make sense of this kind of image? The easiest way to read this, I think, would be to say what it exemplifies is genteel advertising, repackaging distasteful labour for the sensibilities of the West End. This interpretation would see depictions of night carts flanked by classical columns or placed within frothy frames wound about with flowers as paralleling how some Georgian gentry prettified their outhouses or resembling the euphemistic language of the Norwich nightman who styled his trade cloacina purifiers. But when these engravings, I suggest, adopted refined aesthetic codes to advertise a fetid practice, 
there's more going on than an anxious desire not to remind the aristocracy that their shit stank. Just as there was a level of wit and knowing irony in the use of the golden pole as a shop or yard sign, there were elements of humorous incongruity when a sweep or nightman's work is adorned with plumb lines or putty. And designers surely knew it. 18th century readers found this kind of juxtaposition amusing. Newspapers relished reporting the Ludgate Nightman who styled himself as licensed to deal in perfumery. A letter to the St. James Chronicle complaining of the increasing vacuity of claims to virtue predicted that it would soon, quote, not be remarkable if a Nightman should go into our vaults with an amiable condescension. Some of these adverts draw attention to their dialogue with other aspects of graphic culture, seeking to make their referent other images as well as the sordid evacuation of waste. The ads for John Hunt and John Cole are a case in point. Now, Hunt's engraving, which is probably the work of the engraver George Bickham, has ostentatiously varied calligraphy. It has hills in the background and a kind of nicely picturesque cart showing his carting trade. And uh, you also have these side figures who seem to have wandered in from Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. We might, we think, be looking at the Tubman, the Ropeman, and the Holman. But the image also links this trade publicity to European prints of the urban poor appreciated by print collectors and connoisseurs. They derive from gold finders at work in London, a late 17th century engraving owned by Samuel Pepys. This, in turn, was rela is related to Annabali Karachi's depiction of a well or privy cleaner from his 1646 collection of street trades. You can see the relation there. And more closely to a scene in Giuseppe Maria Mattelli's 1660 reworking of Caracci for the Bologna Street Cries, as you can see. But they also belong to a general image bank of street cries collected by European and indeed English connoisseurs right up to 1800. There's a clear relation of these figures to the um, to figures in Gaetano Zompini's 1785 Street Trades of Venice. A collection which you find many examples of where they've actually replaced the Italian verses with English translations, so they've actually been customised for English melody on the Grand Tour. But other cards brought together the polite and the lowly in unexpected and unstable ways. The best example is John Wigley's publicity. This card is dated, the receipt on the back is dated 1744. And it's clearly adapted from John Wells's flyer, which is used, was being used in 1740, but it's clearly somewhat older now. And continues to get reworked, as in the case of Gibson. Now, at first glance, we could be looking at the portrait of a fashionable Georgian gentleman in front of house and garden, hand on hip, holding a staff like Ashley Cooper in Hogarth's portrait, or the central figure in Edward Haightley's The Brockman Family. The scene is semi-rustic, with scene and figure framed by trees. We look out into the garden, stretching out behind him, and then spot the figures pouring shit into a night cart. We can just make out the seat, sorry, the seat in the house of office. We read that the nonchalant figure, gazing out from the frame, performs all the business, boom, boom, the joke was current then, to the satisfaction 
of all persons that employ him. It's hard to work out how to read this image. But the scene, once one starts looking at it, is clearly bifurcated. On the right, the polite house front. On the left, the night cart. The nightman similarly bifurcated, with a patch on his left hand disorderly leg. Now, is Wiggly setting himself up as a member of polite society, but allowing the image to undercut his pretensions? Are the owners of such fashionable houses being slyly reminded of their own physicality? Are the conventions of polite portraiture being gently made fun of? Other images raise comparable questions. One of Lawrence's publicity bills rather appropriately suspends the Prince of Wales feathers over a night cart, but it's probably because it was an ad adaptation from another woodcut. <coughs> Miller and Kernard's 19th early 19th century trade card is even slipperier. Uh, it announces that they're sweeps and nightmen to the excise and East India Company. Now, one level, this is a dutiful visual acknowledgement of distinguished patronage. But when you start thinking about what it means to have as heraldic supporters a sweep and a nightman, a parodic par possibility and potentiality emerges. It recalls Smollett's travesty of royal ceremonial in the history of the atom, where Pitt the Elder, Fifi Kaka in the history of an atom, progresses up a stair built from a fig box, a bag of soot, and a nightman's tub. The satiric possibilities of this material is best caught in sketches of fairyland or a comparison between England and Lilliput of 1810. The caption to the third slide declares that in Lilliput we often see merit in distress and ignorance rolling in affluence. If such facts were mentioned in England, they would not be believed. The street scene contrasts a lean, deserving author, historian, with a fat, complacent placement. Behind him, a poster reads, Slush Bucket, Nightman to His Majesty. Now, you shouldn't push this too hard. Nightman's publicity material was no more likely to engage in biting social criticism than it was actually going to promise to spill shit all over the house. But these ironic inflections, these deployments of a language of wit, registered the contradictions inherent in this material. These ambiguities registered the, the position of Sherwin, who engraved some of them, men who operated in the most prestigious exhibition spaces in the capital and produced engravings for these abject trades. They also captured the ambivalence of the nightman's trade itself. N nightman, this trade traversed all kinds of social boundaries. It worked with all kinds of symbolic oppositions. Their trade was filthy and ensured that others might be clean. Their labour brought the ordure buried in a house's backspace into the public thoroughfare. And in the process, nightmen, and particularly the contractors who were commissioning the handbills, surely sought to construct and to sustain a social role and identity <coughs> which acknowledged the sordid nature of their employment, but which also exerted their value to society. Long ago in an article, Charles Fithiam Adams argued that in May Day festivities, 18th century London chimney sweeps went out and parodied the milkmaid's rituals on the streets of the capital. Sweeps in those rituals thus asserted and played with the dirtiness of their trades. Nightman's trade cards, I'd argue, did something similar. Acknowledging and even foregrounding the contrast between cleanliness and dirt so central to their work, but reminding fellow citizens 
of their shared physicality. These cards elevated the trade into the economy of graphic representation while acknowledging the incongruity of trying to accommodate it in most notions of the polite or the aesthetic. Nightman worked with waste. To sell their services, they also worked with notions of decency. Thank you. <laughs>